Americans. To say that relations between Russia and the West have soured in the 21st century would be accurate, but it would not do justice to the real threat that we tend to no longer want to see. As the U.S. pivots more and more to Asia, the rivalry between Washington and Beijing leaves little oxygen for any conflicts between Washington and Moscow. And yet the explosive potential remains, and if anything, it shows no signs of easing. Take a listen to what the head of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service said last week about the menace of Western liberal values. The United States of America and other Western countries continue their attempts to export their totalitarian liberal values in the space of the Commonwealth of Independent States. We propose dedicating today's event to countering the modern hybrid forms of the West's destructive interference in the internal politics of our countries. Those are clear, strong words. My first guest tonight is more qualified than almost anyone to give a realistic read on where the troubled relationship between Russia and the West is headed. In her new book, There Is Nothing For You Here, Fiona Hill takes us from her English roots to those roots that she planted herself in the United States, a transatlantic life and career that has made her one of the authorities in the Western world on Russia. Fiona Hill joins me tonight from Bethesda, Maryland. Ms. Hill, it is good to have you on the program. There is so much that we want to talk with you um, about tonight. I'd like to start, though, by getting your thoughts on what has happened this week with Russia basically saying that they're done trying to work together with NATO. Well, unfortunately, there's been quite a lot of um, events that have precipitated this, uh, that have led up to this point. Um, just a week or so ago, NATO expelled several Russians from the Russian mission uh, to NATO there for inappropriate behavior, malign activity. Uh, there's always been some considerable tension in that uh, effort between NATO and Russia to find a modus operandi. I mean, we recall that you know back in the 90s, we even flirted with the idea of having Russia join NATO in some form. That was then replaced by a NATO-Russia council where uh, we were supposed to be creating a forum for airing grievances and having discussions about how we might work in the future. But Russia has always wanted to have a veto over NATO activities. It didn't accept that um, there was a place in NATO for it because it still saw NATO in a Cold War context. And there's just been this constant back and forth, back and forth of tensions and uh, mutual recriminations. And I think, you know, at this point, after the expulsion of uh, the, the Russian members of uh, the, the mission there, that Russia's doing, you know, one of its classic uh, retaliatory actions and, you know, basically by declaring an end to this latest phase in the relationship. Let's talk about you for a moment. Um, you are a coal miner's daughter from the UK who has lived the American dream, you went to Harvard, became a Russian specialist, worked at the U.S. National Security Council, became an advisor to a U.S. president. Yet in your book, you write this, I am a fluke. My story is the exception that proves the rule of class or socioeconomic immobility in the early 21st century. How so? Well, I could have said the same about the 20th century as well, because that's actually when I started most of my uh, career rise. But I think, you know, we're seeing more and more in Western societies, uh, in the United States, the United Kingdom, where I'm from, you know, and to some degree in Germany and other countries too, that education is no longer the door uh, to uh, opportunity for a job uh, or a career uh, that it used to be. And in fact, in the United States in particular now, education, either finishing high school or going on to further education into a university, has become more of a predictor of how you will vote and how you look at the world than anything else. It's kind of become the new class dividing line. Whereas I, uh, myself, you know, from uh, basically growing up in the United Kingdom when I did in the 60s, 70s and 80s, had every advantage of, uh, of an education opening up doors uh, for the future. And I think that, you know, obviously in places like Germany, you know, for example, education has still got a very strong emphasis. But increasingly in the United States and in the United Kingdom, there's kind of an expectation that social mobility will no longer come through education as it did before. So education, again, is this, this new dividing line uh, for our societies and is having political implications. 
Yeah, and, and you are worried about the future of liberal democracies, uh, but especially the future of the United States. You also write in your book that the current political poison, if you will, will keep on empowering the political extremes, reinforcing the polarizing appeal of populist politicians. And you say it will make the traumas of the four years from 2016 to 2020 seem like a preface rather than a postscript to the United States' democratic demise. Ms. Hill, you're, you're very worried about Donald Trump becoming U.S. president again in 2024. Would that be an apocalypse now for the U.S.? Well, unfortunately, we're already in uh, a major constitutional crisis. I mean, I don't think it's really escaped uh, the, the viewers of Deutsche Welle that President Trump uh, claims that the election was stolen from him in November 2020. He has uh, refused to recognize Joe Biden, and many of uh, members of the Republican Party have done the same as the legitimately elected president. And uh, basically, Donald Trump is insisting uh, on, you know, running again as the candidate for the Republican Party in 2024. He's cast all kinds of questions about um, the uh, validity of not just the presidential election, but the whole electoral system, democracy overall. I mean, you're showing images here of um, President Trump meeting with Vladimir Putin. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I write in the book that uh, Trump has taken out in many respects some of the authoritarian's handbook. Uh, there's an effort underway to try to repress voting in the United States, deny voting to people to make it much more difficult. There's the nationalization of politics at the local and state level, which we didn't used to see in the United States. And the biggest problem right now is the big lie about uh, the, ninth, uh, the 2020 election and also what happened on January 6th in the United States, where I'm sure it was very shocking for Deutsche Welle and other viewers to see a mob storming the U.S. Capitol building and trying to stop the legitimate transfer of executive power and the certification of uh, the, the votes from uh, the 2020 election. And, and that mob was even threatening to hang Vice President Pence, um, who was doing his constitutional role in certifying the election. I mean, it's been a shocking last several months um, and uh, more than a year now, I think for most observers outside of the United States, let alone for those of us inside. Yeah, I think for people looking from outside, it's shocking to think that the future of the United States may definitely include Donald Trump once again. What about the future for Vladimir Putin? This is what he recently said when he was asked about his plans beyond 2024 when his current presidential term ends. Take a listen. Yeah. I prefer not to answer these questions. This is my traditional response. There's plenty of time before the next elections. Conversations like this destabilize the situation. So it is hard to imagine Russia without the, the imprint of Vladimir Putin for the foreseeable future. The country belongs to him, it seems, until when? Well, until he decides to uh, hand it over to a successor that he would presumably handpick, or of course, unless you know fate takes a hand, and this is, uh, you know, deeply destabilizing and dangerous for Russia. Putin himself, when he moved away from the presidency after his first two terms and handed over to uh, Dmitry Medvedev, his close associate, back in 2007, 2008, said it was very destabilizing and very dangerous for all power to be in the hands of one man. Well, that's been quite some time ago now. And he has essentially, with constitutional amendments in uh, 2020, made it entirely possible for him to stay in the presidency until 2030 by which time he will have been at the helm of Russia, either as president or prime minister, for a staggering 36 years, and he'll be well into his 80s. So, I mean, Vladimir Putin himself has made it very difficult for anyone to countenance a Russia without him. And that in itself makes the whole situation very uncertain and makes um, all of the discussions about what comes after him even more perilous because no one can imagine, as you said, a Russia without Putin. And some of his, uh, of his advisors have even said there is no Russia without Putin. So he is the person who has created this situation of, of uncertainty mm -hmm. and of potential instability because the system isn't really set up, apart from in a more superficial uh, manner, for um, envisaging a transfer of power. 
I wonder, has he been enabled by the German Chancellor Angela Merkel? She has been known as the Putin whisperer. Uh, she also kept Nord Stream 2, the pipeline, alive, and she refused to push back as forcefully against an ever-aggressive Russia as Germany's allies would have liked. I mean, how much responsibility does she carry when we're talking about the erosion um, of the liberal values of democracy that she has been seen as embodying? Well, I don't think you can lay the blame on uh, you know Putin and his decision making on Angela Merkel. I certainly think that there is a lot of blame to share in the terms of we needed a lot more solidarity across Europe and also with the United States to push back on a number of issues. I think you know right now we see with the energy crisis that's uh, facing uh, Europe that many of the dark warnings that have come from the United States, going back to in fact the 1960s when the United States opposed the prospect of energy pipelines from the Soviet Union to Europe uh, are now coming to fruition. We always were greatly concerned that there would be uh, a lot of potential for the Soviet Union and then Russia to manipulate uh, the gas market in, in Europe once that mutual dependency uh, came about. And that opportunity is now there uh, in a time of energy shortage and crisis. And we know, of course, that the Russians did you know, manipulate the, the markets and uh, put on a lot of pressure uh, on Ukraine back in 2006. So those warnings have been there for some considerable period of time. But it really took um, a concerted collective effort by Europe to push back against this, not just mm -hmm. uh, not just Germany or the Chancellor. And look, and one um, symbol uh, that is very important is Angela Merkel is leaving power. There is going to be a handover in uh, Germany that's coming up. That's Whereas, right. you know, we've just been talking about the fact that Putin isn't even brokering or um, allowing any kind of discussion about succession or about the future and is just leaving it, you know, to the prospect of him being in power until 2036. Yeah. So, you know, in Germany, we actually have an opportunity right now with a new coalition government and the naming of a new chancellor, a new team to actually show that there is a path forward and that political change can happen in a very important large country. Yeah, that's a very good point to make. You know, you became a household name in the U.S. when you testified during the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump um, in the U.S. Congress. As I was reading through your book, I kept thinking that this is a book, yes, about Russia, but even more, it's a book about all of us here in the West. Did I read that correctly? No, it is a book about all of us. It's a, a it's a book just using my own uh, personal biographic story, but it could be yours and could be others, you know, in this kind of long sweep of time we've had over these last decades. All of our societies have gone through major periods of change. And, you know, the, the, in, in the book, I talk about the, the change from mass manufacturing and heavy industry to the, no, the knowledge economy and the way that this caused great dislocation and uh, socioeconomic grievance and then political outcomes in the rise of populism. Because those who are left behind, be that in East Germany, be that in the northeast of England, where I came from, be that in the Midwest in the United States, felt alienated and disaffected as the economy, society and politics left them behind. Mm -hmm. And we're just on the threshold of another major change. And you know this is actually one of the reasons why we have an energy crisis, because we're on the cusp of trying to make a change, not just into renewables, but into green energy, because of the pressure of climate change. And that will also inevitably lead to people being left behind unless we have a concerted effort in the West in particular to figure out how we make that transition and how we retrain people, it gets back to education again, and give them the skills and the qualifications for the new green economy. Mm -hmm. It is inescapable. And it's again, it's another of those issues that's going to cause a lot of political backlash. We see that in Germany. We see that in the United Kingdom. We see that in the United States. And that's why the book is about all of us, because we all can take some action. We all um, are you know, part of uh, these societies. And democracy is really all about us. It's about how right. we uh, get basically pulled together to move on to the next phase and you know, take care of the people around us, not just try to find political solutions to uh, these larger problems. It's also about thoughtful and considered analysis, which you have given us tonight, for which we are very grateful. Fiona Hill. We appreciate your time and your insights. Please come back and talk with us again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks.